Good morning, everyone. Praise God. Amen. This morning, I want to share with you from the topic, the battered woman. The battered woman. Praise God. I believe we are all very concerned and in awe about the you know, the murdering, the battering of our women in this land. And uh, so God has laid it on my heart to share with you from this topic. Several years ago, I, as part of my fulfillment for uh, MA in theology, I did research uh, on the battered woman. The research was entitled the battered woman, the attitude and response of the church. So this morning, what I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at what the scripture has to say about women and how men should treat women. And then I'm going to also look at some research data that tells you how the world thinks about women and how the church thinks about women. Some, some persons in the church. Amen? And out of that, you know, I pray that we will all be better equipped to assess the situation and to see how we can contribute to transforming our society through our actions, through our decisions, and through our time of praying about the matter. Amen? So praise God. Amen. So let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you created man and you created woman. And you created man and woman in the likeness of your image. Lord, even as our nation is beset by the destruction of so many women at this time, Lord, we pray that you will open the eyes of our understanding to your word so that, Lord, we might be clear from your word what you think about women what you desire for women. Hallelujah. And that, Lord, we ourselves, Lord, might walk in your will and in your purpose as we encourage, as we help women to establish themselves in your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, I cast down every imagination and every high thing that would seek to exalt itself against the knowledge of God in the delivery of this word. I cast them down now in the name of Jesus and I command every such contrary thoughts, opposing thoughts, to loose us now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. So, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 25. Amen. Praise God. So, it says, verse 15, The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, Hallelujah. Notice who the Lord God warned. The Lord God warned him. That's Adam. You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden. Except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat this fruit, you are sure to die. Amen? So... I want us to note that the Lord God warned Adam not to eat 
of that fruit in the garden before Eve was created. Eve was not around. Eve, Eve was not in existence when the Lord God warned Adam not to eat of this fruit in the garden. You know why I want to emphasize that? Because even in church, there is a lot of emphasis. It was the woman who sinned. It was the woman who sinned. But we need to understand that God gave Adam the responsibility. He gave him authority over the earth. And he gave him the responsibility of seeing that himself and no one else would eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So that's the first thing I want to establish. Amen? Because, you know, time and time again, people are, you know, the, the blame is solely put at the feet of women. And, 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 and they use that, you know, they, they use that to, 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 to destroy women. Verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. So, so Eve was not yet created. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Hallelujah. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. Praise God. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. Hallelujah. But still, there was no helper just right for him. That's why bestiality don't work. Amen? No, none, of the, none of the animals were right for him. None of them. He said, I, I, um, so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. Amen? Praise God. And I noted Adam's response and his words. He said, at last, the man exclaimed, This one is born from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united in one. Now the man and his wife were both naked but they felt no shame. There was no sin. So there was no shame. Hallelujah. Praise God. Then, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 10 to 19, God, speaking of God, says, He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. So God, God was calling Adam. Apparently, every morning God met with Adam and they had fellowship. Put it another way, Adam had his devotion with God. Hallelujah. And, and on this morning, 
God came and he was saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? And Adam was hiding because he was naked. And God said, who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, listen to this, it was the woman you gave me, who gave me that fruit, and I ate it. Remember now, earlier on, before Eve was, was created, God gave Adam a charge. He gave Adam a charge. Amen. And he said, he, and God warned him, you may eat, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Praise God. So the man said, it's the woman you gave me. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. Well, she told the truth. Well, part of the truth. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, because you have deceived the woman, you are cursed. Amen? So we need to understand that the devil is cursed. The devil is cursed from that time. He said, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Amen? And then... There is a prophecy here. This is a prophecy. He said, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring. And her offspring is Jesus. He was prophesying of the coming of Jesus. Hallelujah. It says, he goes on to say, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That's Jesus. In other words, Jesus um, was, was, was at, at that time, he was prophesied to deliver a death blow to the devil because a strike in the head is a death blow. While Satan was going to strike Jesus' is heel. In other words, Jesus was going to die on the cross and he was going to be rose, risen for, he was going to be raised from the dead. Amen? That's why it says it's not a, it's not a final death blow. He would, be, he would be crucified and he would rise from the dead. And you will strike his heel. Praise God. So, in, in, the, in the midst of this, there is a a plan of redemption, a plan of salvation for not only Adam, but for Eve. I want you to note that. For not only Adam, but for Eve, because, you know, how some um, church people speak, how some theologians speak, it's as if salvation was for the man and not for the woman. At least in part. And I'm going, to come, I'm, come, I'm going to come to what I'm saying. It says, in verse 16, Then he said to the woman, He said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. He said, And you will desire to control your husbands. Your husband, praise God. 
You will desire to control your husband. And you know, as I read that, I thought about my wife. Praise God, you know, sometimes she come on strong, you know. Like she want to control. Praise God. Lovely woman. Amen? But that just being real. Amen? Sometimes she feels strongly about something. Praise God. And sometimes I have to stand up and say, listen now. Praise God. I am the man of God. <laughs> Praise God. Amen? But, but you see, God, God has, put that, has put that desire in, in women, but women need to control it. Amen? Praise God. So, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule. Now, this is where a lot of the, you know, the bad stuff um, originated. I want you to listen to me, brethren. This is where a lot of the bad stuff originated. But he will rule. The word rule means have dominion reign over you. Now, that was under the curse. That was under the curse. We need to understand that. Because some, some men, they have, they have taken these conditionalities and they have brought them past Calvary. And they are still practicing it after Jesus Christ has redeemed humanity. Including women. You see, some, some men, they are still ruling. They are still having dominion. They are still reigning. And that, that's not what God desires, as we shall see. Amen? Amen. Can, some, can the ladies say praise the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Watch it now. It says, And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife. <laughs> Praise God. When I read that this morning, I thought about my wife too. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's hope I'll get some dinner this evening. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. It says, since you listened to your wife. Now, now listen. I have learned that you need to listen to your wife. There was a time when I never used to listen to her. I was so arrogant, full of pride, you know. It's like, it's only me God talked to. I was like that one time. Amen? So I, I, I learned the hard way to listen to my wife. And there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong. There's a place to listen to your wife. But guess what? When you listen to your wife or you listen to your husband... You have to discern what is of God and what is not of God. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Sometimes I say things that are not of God. She have to listen and she have to discern. Amen. So, so Adam listened to his wife and eat from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. In other words, what his wife was saying was not of God. Praise God. Incidentally, the scripture doesn't say, doesn't say that Adam actually told his wife what God said. But guess what? She knew. So Adam told her. She knew. Adam told her. Amen? That she was not to eat of it. So, so, so God said to Adam, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you, not because of the woman. Can the ladies say praise the Lord? Oh, the ladies don't agree with me at all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, ladies. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. The ground is cursed because of you, Adam. Hallelujah. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a, a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, 
though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. It was not because the woman ate. It was because of Adam. Hallelujah. You see, Adam chose to obey his wife and to disobey God. That's what he did. He was put in charge. And he chose to, to obey his wife and to disobey God. It says, By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. To, to summarize, in the mind of some men, all men have been redeemed from the curse of sin. Because of this, they believe God wants them to prosper. They no longer embrace Genesis 3, 17 to 19. However, in their minds, the woman has not been redeemed. They believe that the, that the woman should still suffer for Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden and that they should still rule. Now the word rule means set of explicit or understood regulations. Amen? Heard of a man who got married on a, on a honeymoon. He took off his pants and he told his wife to put on the pants. And, and, and um, he, when she did that, she noted that the pants could not fit. And the man said, remember who wear the pants. That's a man who wants to rule. All right? But, so, they want to rule or have dominion, which is control over their wives. Women, let me say this. You don't have to feel guilty for Eve's sin any longer. Amen? Don't carry no guilt. No guilt pack on your back. Praise God. Let's look at Ephesians 5, verses 21 to 29. And, and my Bible has a, a, a subheading um, which says, Spirit guided relationships spirit guided relationships do you know that god's plan for marriage is that marriages must be guided by the holy spirit yes if, if they're not guided by the holy spirit they're gonna mash up they're gonna be destroyed wives and husbands all right look at this now it says, and further, I, I want you to, 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 to listen to the biblical language. Amen? It says, verse 21, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Who is he talking to? He's talking to husbands and wives. Amen? What is our topic? The battered woman. Amen? We are looking at scripture and see what scripture has to say about the relationship, that the right, proper relationship that should exist between man and woman to prevent battering of women. Amen? So, let me go again. Verse 21. It says, And further... Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. So, he's talking, the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit is talking about man and woman in marriage submitting to one another. He hear the language now. Hear the language. It goes on. For, 22, for wives. He's treating wives first. Amen? He says, 
four wives, this means, what is he talking about? How husband and wife are to submit to each other. Amen? So, so he's saying here that for, for the wives, this is how it, it flows practically. This is how it flows in reality. It says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. I love that. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Now, if, if I were to go to my wife and I say, well, um, Yasmin, I, I believe we should go and rob a bank, you know. I expect my wife to rebuke the devil that spoke through me. I don't expect her to say, yes, dear, I love you. I will do whatever you want me to do. Amen? Submission must be in the Lord. It must be led by the Lord. And it, and it, must, be, it must line up with the word of God. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. In everything. So practically, how I work that out is that, you know, I, 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 I pray for guidance, I pray for discernment. I listen, I listen as my wife speaks, right? And, and you know, she listens as I speak, and uh, you discern. You discern. Then it says, for husbands, this means. So practically, this is how husbands are supposed to submit to their wives. It says, love your wives. Love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. That is how husbands must love their wives. He must, they must be willing to give up their lives for their wives. I mean, I can't think of greater submission than that. To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Amen? Now there's a sickness where people, you know, they take razors and they cut up themselves um, so that they will bleed. Right? Now those persons... They are sick. They don't love their bodies in that mental state. Amen? So, so any husband who hurts his own body, he's sick. Something is wrong with him. Amen? And, and by extension, any, any man who, who um, practices the, the battering of his wife, he's sick. I say that without apology. He's sick. Mentally, something is wrong with him. He needs, he needs help. But he needs to realize that he needs help. You see, it's very important when a woman is choosing a man that she chooses a man who loves himself. And, and, and let me tell you, you, you can love yourself. You can be very selfish in life. And people say you, you love yourself. But that is not loving yourself. That is not loving yourself.
Praise God. So in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Right? So nobody in their right mind is going to cut themselves. Nobody in their right mind is going to batter a woman. Hallelujah. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares. Feeds and cares. You know what the word care means? It means the provision of what is necessary for the health, welfare, maintenance, and protection. That's what caring means. The provision of what is necessary for the health, welfare, maintenance, and protection. That's what caring means. And so it says that a, a man must care for his wife. He must provide for her. He must make sure she's healthy. A man who batters a woman is not contributing to health. He's contributing to sickness. He's not caring. Welfare, maintenance, and protection. A husband is supposed to protect a wife, not violate her physically or psychologically. He's supposed to protect her. Just as Christ cares for the church. Amen? So praise God. Jesus Christ has redeemed humanity. Jesus Christ has redeemed men and women. Women have been redeemed. And we are no longer in, 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 that, in that Old Testament realm where, where the man dominates and controls. And, and, I, and I believe God didn't mean that the man must violate the woman. Even at that time. But it's no longer. That is no longer the case. Jesus Christ has redeemed the woman. And here in Ephesians, God is saying in his word that the husband must love the wives as they love themselves. They must be prepared to lay down their lives for their wives. Praise God. I, I'm going I'm to read, uh, you know, there's some literature review that I did. And I'm just going to read some sections of it. And here, I was looking at sociological and gender considerations. It says, quoting statistics published by the United Nations, 1986, Rico notes, that the main victim, victims of domestic and family violence are normally children, the elderly, and women. He informs us, however, that research indicates that most victims of violence are women and that at the global level, one out of every ten women has been attacked by their spouses or partners. One out of every ten women across the earth. This is worse than the, the, pan, the coronavirus. Praise God. He further notes that 2% of the victims of acts of violence committed by a spouse or partner are men. 75% are women and 23% are cases of reciprocal violence. According to Buzzard, when we speak of violence in the home, we are addressing an incident, an ancient cultural flaw in our society that has been socially and historically conditioned. I want you to note this. 
This flaw is said to be rooted in the age-old attitudes towards women as reflected in the institution of marriage, women's limited access to legal and economic leverage and religious dogma under a dominant male system. This will tell us how to pray. Buzzard is, however, quick to point out that the theologians of our ancient past were not the only ones who contributed to the devaluation of women. She identifies platonic spirit spiritualism with its body-denying anti-woman ethic as being present throughout history in the teachings of lawyers, philosophers, public officials, and other secular leaders. As an example of the need of the male mind to maintain control over the female body, she cites a speech of a Roman consul, Marcus Precious Cato, who chastised a group of women for having publicly protested the denial of their legal and civil rights. Right? So, Women were protesting at that time that their, their civil rights, their legal rights were being denied. And this is what this, this Roman said. He said, Romans, if every married man had made sure that his own wife looked up to him and respected his marital authority, we should not have this trouble with women in general. See the mindset? But no, having let female insubordination triumph first in our homes, we find our privileges trodden and trampled on in the public forum. We have failed to control each woman individually, and we find ourselves quailing before a body of them. Woman, he goes on, woman is a violent and uncontrolled animal, and it is useless to let go the reins and then expect her not to kick over the traces. You must keep her on a tight rein. Women want total freedom, or rather, to call things by their names, total license. If you allow them to achieve complete quality with men, do you think they'll be easier to live with? Not at all. Once they have achieved equality, they will be your masters. So Buzzard writes after that quotation, she says, this attitude toward women continued in secular writings throughout the entire medieval period. So it's coming from way back. On the later common law practice, it was therefore impossible for women to challenge their husbands' right to control them and even to do violence to them. The first major challenge to the system of injustice towards women in the West came in 1878 when a British historian, Francis Power Cobber, in a bold and unprecedented account, appealed to the British Parliament to put in place laws that would protect women from the brutal behavior of their men. Bossert quotes the following section from Cube's well-documented -docum account of wife torture in England which expresses her insight into the legal problem of property rights over women. In those days, women were regarded as property. Here is what was written. The general appreciation of women as a sex is bad enough. Can you imagine? But in the matter we are considering, the special depreciation of wives is more directly responsible for the outrages they endure. The notion that a man's wife is his property is the fatal root 
of incalculable evil and misery. Every brutal-minded man and many a man who in other relations in life is not brutal entertains more or less vaguely the notion that his wife is his thing and is ready to ask with indignation of anyone who interferes with his treatment of her, may I do what I will with my own. It is even sometimes pleaded on behalf of poor men that they possess nothing else but their wives and that consequently it seems doubly hard to meddle with the exercise of power in this narrow sphere. According to Buzzard, 1986, Cube's brave efforts initiated a movement towards equality and protection for women under the law. However, legal reforms in the United States and in England were slow in coming. It was not until the turn of the century that meaningful changes in the law on behalf of women have occurred. Praise God. Amen. And do you know that up until the 1970s that there were some Caribbean territories who regarded women as property? Up until the 1970s. Amen. So, it's a, it's a, a process and a continuous struggle. And today, you know, we have men who are battering women. And their mindset is that women are their property and they can do with women as they feel. And that is wrong. Praise God. Amen. So, I'm going to read another section and then I'm finished. Separating fact from myth. Fact from myth. While interviewing members of the clergy, Miles in 2000, 2000, the year 2000, discovered that many false beliefs about domestic violence exist. He lists and examines the four most frequently mentioned myths. And I'm going to share these four myths and then I'm finished. One, there are no abused women in my congregation. So that's a myth. There are no, in other words, anyone who would say there are no abused women in my congregation, that's not true. It's a myth. Two, listen to this. This is a lie from the devil. Christian survivors need only faith, prayer, a positive attitude, and God to be freed from domestic violence. Statements like the following, couched as sound spiritual advice, blame abused women for their own victimization. In other words, it's saying that their husbands are victimizing, are abusing them because they don't have faith. It's not a lie from the devil. It's a lie from the devil. Hallelujah. And keep them, it, 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 it blame, blames abused women for their own victimization and keep them imprisoned in dangerous relationships. He believes that such platitudes must be absolutely avoided. He lists the following commonplace expressions. They say to abused women, even in the church, Stop feeling sorry for yourself. That's not of God. Leave the past in the past and thank God for all your blessings. God will never give you more than you can handle. 
Otherwise, you can take two more bucks. All Christians have crosses to bear. A bad husband father is better than no husband father at all. Although the abuse is terrible, it will make you a much stronger Christian. <laughs> Praise God. Lord have mercy. Amen. Praise the Lord. Submit yourself totally to the will of your husband and then the abuse will stop. That's a myth. Go back to your husband and pray for a miracle. God calls us to be a living sacrifice. You have to work harder at being a good wife or mother, sexual partner, etc. In other words, if you work harder, it's because you're not working hard enough while you're being violated. And that's, that's, that's a lie. Praise God. Suffering builds character. Your faith in God will turn this negative experience into a positive outcome. It will save your marriage. Another myth, this is the third one, is that domestic violence occurs only in certain cultural, racial, and sub-economic groups, and only in urban groups. Platitudes which support this view includes the following. Betty sounds like a Hispanic name. I thought the article said Betty is black. It doesn't, by the way. The figure in the graphic looks like an Indian woman. Women from minority races are abused more frequently than white women. Do you know that all of these things are lies? All of those statements are lies. Amen? It has, it, knows, it has no boundary. Has no boundary. Whether uptown or downtown. In fact, sometimes for the uptown people, it's worse. It's worse. The fourth myth is, it's stated by Miles, is that, as stated by Miles, is that victims can stop the battering by changing their behavior. Putting responsibility on the woman and saying it is because of her behavior why she's been battered. And that is a lie. This will save their marriage and families. He cites Jacobson and Gottman in When Men Batter Women who said, Battering has little to do with what the women do or do not do. What they say or don't say. It is the batterer's responsibility and his alone to stop being abusive. Praise God. Amen? Hallelujah. So, praise God. I'm going to stop here. But today, I believe that I hope that we understand from Scripture that the battering of women is not of God. It is not of God. Amen? And we need to understand that there are historical biases and prejudices which exist even today. And we need to pray in an informed way. There are strongholds that possess the minds of men and even some women. Incidentally, you do have women who batter men. But it's a, it's a minority, a small group, but smaller group. 
Amen? So, let us continue to pray about what's happening in our nation. And let's be wise in how we conduct our lives. Amen?